The reason we started with that is because how pure of a list is his thankfulness list? And will you turn the choir lights on for me, uh, the backstage on? Um, I love how childlike that list was and how encouraging it may be for us to think that way. Like, simple. What are we thankful for? And so it's going to start us off. We're in Colossians. We're going to start our study there. Uh, We're in verse 3 is where we're going to be. But the reason we bring that up is because in what we have to remember for the whole day is Paul is writing in this moment to a church that he is commending them, but really his prayer is what we are studying today. And it is thankfulness to God for these people. And so this is the heart of where we are starting in thanksgiving of what God has done. And so with that in mind, we're going to read, starting in verse 3 of Colossians, it says this, We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints... Because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Of this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel, which has come to you, and as indeed in the whole world, and it is bearing fruit and growing or increasing, as it does among you since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth, just as you learned from Epaphras, our beloved servant, He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. Let's pray together as we start today. Lord, speak. Speak the words we need to hear now. Speak clear and speak to us as individuals from this ancient text that has fresh words for us now. Lord, we are here to hear from you. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. So as we discussed, and Sean, you're going to pull me down a little bit. I'm a hair hot over here. Um, as we discussed uh, last week, Paul is writing a letter to real people in a real city with real problems going on there. But these are people that he has never met. He has only heard of. It's a town that he has never visited. So what would Paul say to these strangers is about what we're to jump into. But before he explains or teaches them anything, he writes a letter of thanksgiving to a people he's never met because he met their pastor. And I assume that I'm a little bit like Epaphras because when I meet somebody, I can't help but tell them, about what is going on around here. I'm sure people get frustrated or, be, or they don't want to listen, but I will tell anybody that wants to hear or that stands near me how God is working in this place. And I just share and share and I report and I report and I just tell stories about what God is doing in individual lives and in this community's life, and it's just amazing. And so I imagine that Epaphras, when he met Paul, most likely in prison, I imagine that he just couldn't help but share what God was doing in the town of Colossae that he was getting to pastor. And so Epaphras has told Paul, and Paul is so encouraged by what is happening here. And so he is doing this prayer then of thanksgiving. He is praying, thanking God for what God has done in this church and through this church. He's not just saying Hey, Colossians, I'm really proud of you. Hey, Colossians, you're doing great things. No, he is saying, hey, Colossians, I want you to know that I am praying for you in the ways that God is working in some awesome ways. Now, you may read verse 3 where it says, we always thank God for you. But, but what we need to understand is that Paul isn't saying that all I ever do is just pray for you guys, some group of strangers that I've never met. No, what Paul is saying is that when I pray, as he adds at the end of verse 3, when I am praying, I always, when I pray for you, I'm always thanking God. 
It is a good prayer. It's an exciting prayer. It's not a burdened prayer, but a, but a joyful and encouraging prayer. Most likely, <clears throat> Paul would have had a scheduled prayer life stemming from his days of Judaism, where he would pray at morning, at noon, and in the evening. And so Paul is praying constantly and in a schedule for this group. And as I was thinking about that and just about Paul's prayer life for these people, it began to make me wonder, what does our prayer life look like? Is there discipline associated with our prayer life? <clears throat> or maybe you, you just go, well, we're supposed to be praying at all times. Sure. <clears throat> but do you have scheduled times of prayer where you go, I am setting this moment aside where nothing is going to interrupt, nothing is going to get in the way, and during these times, I am really taking part and spending time with God. I'll be honest with you, at the beginning of Lent, I was really focused on this and was really seeing my prayer life grow. And then as Lent continued and day 30 or so, I began to see it start waning a bit. That's just an honest confession. That's just who I am. It doesn't mean that I'm happy about that. I want it to continue to grow, and I, I'm still trying to put some steps in my life where my prayer life does grow, but do we have schedules and discipline to how we pray? One idea God has placed on my heart this week is a very simple question. How can I pray for you? The way that God put it on my heart is he said, I want you to ask that every day to someone. It's simple, it's easy, but, but when we have all of these uh, busyness and hustle and bustle and, and we meet all these people, what if intentionally every day I sought out one person to just say, how can I pray for you today? And there doesn't have to be rules associated with it. It can be Carlin, it can be Cooper, you don't have to make this harder, it can be Mike, my barber, or Matt, my friend. It can be Chris, my neighbor. It can be the clerk at Walmart. I'm not making rules to this, but God's kind of laid on my heart this question, how can I pray for you? And what if every day, via a conversation in person or a text or a phone call, what if we just added to our daily repertoire of living that question one time a day? How can I pray for you? What would that look like? How would that deepen our, our trust in God, but also our relationships with one another. So Paul says, I thank God for you in my prayers. And now he explains in verse 4 what he's praying for. He says in verse 4, he says, Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Paul is thankful for their faith, for their love, and for their hope. Some of you may go, but he got them out of order, and that just frustrates me, right? It's supposed to be, I mean, Hobby Lobby is copyrighted, it, faith, hope, and love. All right? I, th I think they're getting it from 1 Corinthians, though. Uh, but Paul, I think it's very intentional. Their faith, their love, and their hope. So their faith, it's more than just an intellectual assent to a set of beliefs that they say, yeah, we agree to. No, their faith is placed in Jesus as the leader of their life and the Lord of their life. They are trusting him to rule and reign within them. It's more than just mental assent to God and going, yeah, I think that makes sense, like two plus two, or when I drop something, it falls. This is a, a faith that changes how we live. He sees their faith that they have in Christ Jesus. And then it says, and your love for all the saints. This word for love is agape, which is God's type of love towards us. And he says that you are living out God-like love for all the saints. I was trying to understand, well, what does that really mean? And one person explained it this way. They're, they're practical expressions of care and concern towards others that they may not or they are not doing it for any benefit other than for the good of the other. Care and concern simply for others' good. This love is displayed by Jesus when he takes off his coat and he starts washing the disciples' feet. 
The love that Jesus models for us is the love that we are to pick up and to continue. And he says that you all in Colossae are loving in a way that is noticeable. And you have a love for all the saints. Paul says that they have this faith and they live out this love because of their hope. You see it in verse 5. The hope because of the hope laid up in heaven for you. Hope is the basis of their faith and the basis of their love. Hope is what is leading them to live in this way. Now, it makes sense that hope is a big and pivotal, pivotal uh, part of Epaphras' teaching because he is teaching a mostly Gentile or pagan or non-believer group of people. And, and when Epaphras shows up and he says, let me tell you about Jesus, the one who defeated the grave. Let me tell you about the one whose body began to breathe. Let me tell you about the one who had an empty tomb that he walked out of. Let me tell you about him because he has defeated the undefeatable. He has defeated death. See, I was thinking about it this week, and honestly, death is a real fear for most people. Maybe not, maybe for you, you're going, I, I, I see a bigger purpose in death. I get that. But all of us fear the pain and the agony and the struggle or maybe the, the heartbreak that it causes on our loved ones, right? All of us, nobody is looking forward to the process of dying at all, okay? But what is being taught to the Colossians and what is differentiating Christianity is something that no other religion can offer here. See, every religion understands that we are going to die. But what Epaphras has taught these people in Colossae is that they have hope beyond the grave. They have hope after death. Every single one of us is going to succumb to our body failing at some point. That's not really in question. The question that matters is what happens after that? And do we have a hope that goes beyond the grave? Do you have a hope that goes beyond this life? I tell very few preacher stories, so let me do one or two a year, okay? I'm just not, I don't guess I have enough gray hair to do no preacher stories yet, but I guess we'll get there eventually. We'll run out of Cooper, Carlin, and Jordan stories, and we'll have to transition to those. But I, I saw this this week, and it just, it got me. So there was a husband and a wife. They lived up in Minnesota. Uh, they may have been neighbors with Nell back in the day. And so they, they lived up in Minnesota, and the winter was just long, and they were hard, and so they had booked a trip to go to Florida. They had to fly two separate flights uh, because the wife had a work thing, and so the husband got away on Friday. The wife was coming down on Saturday. He flew in. He got the rental car. He got the uh, condo all set up or the hotel all set up. He went and got groceries. Everything was ready, and then he noticed this was back in the mid-'90s for the story's sake. It was back in the mid-'90s. He didn't want to call and let her know because it was going to be long distance, and nobody likes to do that. And so he noticed that the hotel, there was a computer, and they were just trying out email, and it says, you can send emails for free. And so he sat down, he said, well, I'm going to try this out. So he typed up an email, and as he was pressing send, and you know, it's kind of making that whoosh noise as it's going away forever, he realized he mistyped his wife's email address. Well, the person who received the email was a recently widowed woman. And when I say recent, she just got back from the funeral of her husband, and she sat down at her computer, because she's a techie gal, okay? Even back in the mid-90s, she had her AOL ready to go. So she sat down, and she was looking over the condolences, and then one stood out. It said, my loving wife. Well, that was a surprise. So she, she read it, and then she fainted. They heard the noise, and her, uh, her son heard the noise and rushed in to check on his mom. 
And as he was lifting her up, he saw the screen and he started reading it and it said this, I have arrived. It was quite an uneventful trip. They have computers here now to email your loved ones. That's nice. You are scheduled to arrive tomorrow. I can't, I can't wait to see you. P.S. It's hot. I thought it was too good not to share. But can you imagine being a wife who comes home from burying her husband? And you don't have hope? You don't have anywhere to turn? Anything to look forward to? Hope matters. And hope that Jesus had defeated death, had defeated the grave, that he had redeemed us and restored us and renewed us and made us right and given us a home and given us a future and given us eternity. This is what they are believing. And this changes every bit of their life. So yes, they can love and they can wash feet every single day because they know there's going to be a better day. They can be abused and mistreated, and they can suffer because they know something greater is coming, because they follow someone greater. Hope is what was leading them to live this way. And I love how he writes it there. He says, a hope that is laid up in heaven for you. It can't be stolen. It can't be taken. It can't be manipulated. As Paul, Peter will write in 1 Peter 1.5, he says, it is being protected by God or guarded by God. See, these Jews were coming in and saying, oh, you want to follow our God now? Great. Well, you need to eat this kosher diet. You need to celebrate these festivals. You need to abstain from going over there or doing this. And what Paul is saying is, do not be confused. Do not fall for their traps. Do not listen to them. Your hope is laid up in heaven for you, and they can't touch it. And that gives encouragement. Paul then transitions. He says, your hope is built on the word of truth, the gospel. See, we throw around the word gospel all the time in church, right? Believe in the gospel. Just preach the gospel, preacher. Do you know the gospel? Can you teach the gospel? Have you you believed the gospel? But what is gospel? We teach to kids it's good news, but typically that word would have been used to discuss a military victory. It was good news that the enemy was not going to be besieging our town in the next day. It was good news that we were going to stay where we are, that we won, that we were victorious. And I guarantee you, Paul loves the idea that gospel is connected with military victories because Paul understands that the victory of Jesus in the grave was a victory over Satan, a foe. It was a victory over death. That Jesus had won the victory, so this is good news of great joy for all people. And he just wants them to know it and to believe it and to see it. It is good news. The enemy is finished. It has been defeated. Where death is your sting? Where is your victory? Now, he says as we transition to verse 6, He says this good news is spreading. This gospel is spreading. And as it is over the whole world, and it is bearing fruit and increasing as it does so among you. I want us to key in with our last little bit of minutes here on this idea of bearing fruit and increasing. I think that this concept points us back to two different places. One, to the Garden of Eden. Remember when God, he's made everything, it's very good. Man and woman, he's placed there there to, uh, to work the land and to keep it. And they had the other thing that they were supposed to do besides just work in the land was to be fruitful and multiply. Remember? To bear fruit and increase. God wanted his people to flourish and to grow. And Paul is saying the gospel is bearing fruit and multiplying. It's being fruitful and multiplying. The other option that I see that it can connect with is in Matthew 13 where it talks about the parable of the sower who is going and distributing seed. And some falls on the road and is trampled or eaten by the birds. 
Some fall in the thorns, and it's choked out, and some among the rocks. But then do you remember the, soil, the, so, the seed that falls among the good soil? It's fruitful and multiplies. It grows a hundredfold or sixtyfold or thirtyfold. It is fruitful and multiplies. And this is what the gospel is doing. And Paul is saying that the gospel is bearing fruit all over the world beyond what you can even know or see. I was thinking about it even this morning as I was working through this sermon, just reciting it a few times in my head and going, wait a second, while we sleep, People are coming to faith in Jesus Christ. The kingdom is expanding even while we are sleeping because our God does not slumber or sleep. And so across the globe, God is working all around us. God is working. We can get so caught up in being just kind of demoralized or promoting the state of what's happening in the Metroplex or in Texas or in the South or in the Bible Belt or even in America as a whole. And, and we can sit and gripe because morals are being abandoned all around us. Values have been forgotten. We are redefining things I don't think needed new definitions. And yet, here, what Paul is reminding us is that the, the gospel is going forth even when we don't see it, even in places we've never been, even with people we don't know, the gospel is moving forward. In China and in, in other parts of Asia and in India and in the South America and Europe and the Middle East and Africa, the gospel is going forth to unreached people and unevangelized places. And Paul says it's also bearing fruit and increasing among you. Because what you heard, you understood. I was thinking about it, you know, man, how great is it when hearing turns to understanding? The teachers in this room wish that that was an automatic process. But understand that sometimes we have to hear it and hear it and hear it. But what I'm seeing here in the book of Colossians is that what was taught to their head has now infected their heart. And as we said last week, it's activating their hands. The gospel is bearing fruit and is increasing. He says that, let's see what verse it is. Just as you learned it from Epaphras, verse 7, our beloved servant, he is a faithful minister. This last week I sat at a conference with a bunch of ministers asking how can we renew our church in a way that honors God. And, and there's so much that a pastor is supposed to do, right? We have to be able to understand profit and loss sheets, okay? So we have to be good at accounting. Well, we need to know Robert's rules of order, which I still don't know, um, but we're supposed to know those things. We, we are supposed to be good marketers, good at connecting with people. We're supposed to be able to write sermons. We're supposed to be able to teach the deep truths of the Scripture. And we're supposed to be able to walk with families through the loss of their loved ones. The job of pastor can be really difficult and can be overwhelming. And, and then I got to thinking about what is the main job that I'm supposed to do? And I wrote down, a faithful minister is the one who points people to the truth. Points people to the truth. No matter how much I want every single person breathing in this room to be saved, I cannot save any of you guys. I can't. No matter how much I want every single one of those kids over there to be saved, I can't save them. But my role in an attempt to be a faithful minister is to point you to what saves Every Sunday, every Wednesday, every Monday through Friday in your inbox, every interaction to point you to what saves. Because the truth of the death and the resurrection of Jesus changes lives. It is good news of great joy. That means we are victorious. I point you to the fact that his cross is more than enough for all of your sin. Epaphras was a faithful minister who taught the truth, and the truth transforms the truth transforms lives. This last week we looked at Paul in our devotions and saw how his life was fully transformed by the gospel when he met the risen Jesus on the road to Damascus. The truth transforms lives. The truth also transforms churches. It was transforming the church in Colossae. Finally, the truth will transform communities. 
they will be changed when the people of God live and love like God in their community to those around them. They cannot help but experience it. Paul ends by saying that they are loving in the Spirit, which is just living out God's type of love. But I want to end, I want to end today just considering these five verses for you personally. Paul is thanking God for what he has done in and through the church of Colossae. And he thanks him for many things, for their faith and for their love, for their hope, for their bearing fruit and increasing, for them living out the love of God. And I just ask you, would that be said of you? If, you, if I got a report from your coworkers and from your neighbors and from your kids and from your family that you see three times a year at holidays, and that's plenty, if I got a report from all of these people, tell me a little bit about, insert your name here. Would your faith and would your love and would your hope come out? Would what God has done in you begin to show forth through you? Are you bearing fruit and increasing? And if so, awesome, how do you continue that? And if not, what needs to change? What about our church? Could that be said of our church? Are we living out the love of God? Are we bearing fruit and increasing in our community? Are we pointing people to what saves? See, I've been focused on this phrase, bearing fruit and increasing all week. And I say this honestly, not in a way to brag or not in a way to boast or any way. But as I look at our church, I honestly believe that we are bearing fruit and increasing. I see it and feel it, church. We can look at metrics all day long. There's some easy metrics to score with. You can look at attendance or children's ministry or finances. And yes, we are doing great in all of those metrics. It's awesome. I can also look at spiritual metrics and just changes of heart. And I look that we've done 13 community events in the last 16 months. We're reaching our community. I look and, and I see just the way that this sanctuary feels, pre-service and especially post-service once everybody's in here, that the, the volume in here has gone up 50 decibels because you're starting to know each other and talk with each other, and share with each other. I truly believe our pursuit of God is growing. I see it in metrics of devotional emails, but I see it in conversations when you tell me about your new Bible that you've been excited to read. You tell me about these books that you're ordering and things that God is teaching you. I truly believe our church is bearing fruit and increasing. And honestly, as your pastor, it is such a joy to be a part of that. It's so rewarding to just see what God is doing, not what I'm doing, not what me and Kelly and Sean are doing, but what God is doing. Even as I look out at faces, that there's no reason to think, but only because God orchestrated it. I sat this week, as I told you, at a conference helping churches see when they need to be renewed. The stat that was thrown out is about 95% of churches are either plateaued or declining. The state of the church in America. And, and as a lot of people were wanting to wrestle with that or argue with that, or my, the thing I hated most was when they blamed the community for that. Well, they just won't show up anymore. They just keep scheduling ball practice. Make church more important than ball practice and people will be here. You know, Matt and I coach a soccer team and our practice attendance is really great. If we could make church as meaningful as that, that's our goal because it matters more. I sat there and I heard them griping and complaining or just stunned by that fact. But you know, while I sat there, I was thankful. I was thankful for especially the existing members of this church post 16 months ago. Because you guys wrestled through really difficult questions. You made a lot of really tough decisions. 
You were brutally honest about the state of things and that things had to change. You banded together for the good of this place, not just for your own good. You believed that God was not finished here. You knew that you'd probably not get all your preferences. Some of your favorite programs would go away. But those things took a back seat to your desire for the kingdom of God to expand in this area. So I wrote you a letter. It's choppy, but it's just trying to give my heart of what I feel as I think about with thanksgiving what you have done. If you have started coming in the last 16 months, I will need you to hear this because I need you to hear what these people have done to cultivate this, to be a place where we can come into worship and to meet God and to follow Him. And for those of you that have been here for years and years, I just want you to hear this thank you. I thank you, God, for the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ at FBC Farmers Branch. I thank you that these brothers and sisters dared to dream they dared to tell the truth about their situation and they were convicted that God was not finished here. They decided, and I thank you that you decided to make hard decisions to move forward with a replant knowing that on the table was relocation and name change and a lot of other difficult things that could happen. But I thank you that you continued to trust God, to dream to dream of a day where we could reach our neighbors, to dream of a day when the people who live in those apartments would call this place home, to dream of a day where we would be a light in the community that was not put out. I thank you that you did not abandon the church or this church. I thank you you didn't stop hoping. Thank you that you've laid down your desires for a desire for God's kingdom. And I'll be honest, many people have asked when I start telling them what's happened here about what we have done, what we've changed, what we've removed, what we've replaced. And they always ask me, now, Jordan, how does your church feel about that? And that's when I get the biggest smile. Because I say, let me tell you, they have jumped on board. They have believed. They have been willing to put aside their preferences to be a part of something that God was doing. And so, church, it is such a joy to be your pastor. It's a joy to attempt to lead you on this journey of bearing fruit and increasing. And honestly, church, I said this at the end of July last year, and I believe it even more now, we're only just at the beginning of what God wants to do here. The gospel is bearing fruit and is increasing all over the world. And I honestly believe it is happening in these walls and outside in this city as well. The truth is transforming lives. The truth is transforming this church. And the truth will transform this community. So with my deepest and most honest appreciation, I just say thank you. I know it was hard. Thank you. I guarantee you all these other people that have been a part of our church in more recent months say thank you as well. So, Kelly, you guys can come on up, you and everybody that's singing and playing. As you consider these five verses today, consider, is faith and love lived out in your life? Do you have hope that goes beyond the grave? Are you bearing fruit and increasing? And are you trusting the truth of the gospel, the good news of salvation that is found in Jesus Christ?